Well, hi, Glenna. Happy New Year's. Hi, Linda. Nice to see you. Yeah, it seems like a propitious time for us to talk about why dialogue matters today. We just entered a new year, had a crazy election cycle. So here we are. It's been 20, 25 years since we first founded the dialogue group, and a lot has happened. So why don't we um, first start off by talking about how dialogue differs a bit from what we, we used to teach, uh, which is phone dialogue. Okay, I, that's great. I think it's important to make the distinction because in the last 25 years, dialogue has become a very popular word and a popular process. And there are lots of forms of dialogue out there. Um, and they share a lot in common with BOEM dialogue and there's some key distinctions. So first let's talk about what we see out there when people are saying, oh, we're gonna have a dialogue. Um, some of the characteristics that we see are that people are indeed coming together to talk to each other. They're asking questions, they're listening to what other people are saying. They're even in some sense suspending some of their judgments and saying, okay, let me put that aside and really you know, see what this person is talking about. So there's more respect between people. There's less interrupting, you know, talking at multiple people at the same time. And I think there's more of a willingness for people to share what they're really thinking and feeling. Yeah, I'd say that's right. I think the word has sort of seeped into how we converse in general, which is really a good thing. But uh, as Stu and I both know, uh, what makes bone dialogue different um, is a whole different thing. There's this meta metacognitive level uh, where we're asking people to look more at the um, the, the levels of their thinking, the assumptions that they're making, so that we can more get at that tacit level of our cultural conditioning, for instance, that normally we're just unconscious of. And we really can't do it unless we are in a dialogue setting, because I, can, I don't always know what I'm unconscious of, but you can point it out, right? So that's what makes dialogue so very powerful. And uh, the other thing that I think the other form of dialogue doesn't really pay attention to is looking at the whole meaning of a conversation. Uh, so often in other forms of conversation, we'll have people uh, defending their perspectives, like in discussion, you know, I, and they're, what, what they're really trying to do is to say, I'm right. Well, obviously that means the other is wrong. And when you have that kind of attention going that way, it feels much more like a ping pong game than it does looking at, well, what are we all saying together? How are we making meaning here together? So I'd say those are the two things that distinguish it most for me. Great. And I'm just going to add one little piece to what you were talking about metacognitively, because indeed, David Bohm, his for him, dialogue was all about us being able to make visible our thought system. In other words, that shared meaning that we create together through the assumptions that we hold and the beliefs that we have. And until we can actually get a look at that, we don't really know whether what we're doing is coherent or incoherent. Right. Um, so that's a primary purpose. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. So what, so given these distinctions, um, why do we say that dialogue is, it's really important today? What is going on today that makes, we believe, makes it so important to refocus our attention on Bohmian dialogue? Right. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is fragmentation. Now, Bohm used to always talk about fragmentation, but I'm talking about the greater fragmentation that we're seeing even in just our own society. You know, with the media right now, we've got so many choices. Uh, my gosh, the internet has created thousands of ways we can pay attention to the news. And the news that we pay attention to has even become more opinionated. You know, if I tend to be on the conservative side of things, I watch my stations. And if I tend to be on the liberal side, I watch different stations. And so we're developing all these little tribes that don't talk to each other and that, that believe <laughs> very insular things. And so that's, what make, that's what's making dialogue even more difficult, I think, in our society. What's a big one for you? Well, it's interesting because when you talk about fragmentation and focusing on the parts rather than the whole, you know, I also realized that so many of our challenges we're learning, and they probably always were, but we're really becoming aware that they're global. You know, they're not local. You know, climate change would be one example. Immigration, which you were talking about, is another. These things are not just local issues. And so we need to be able to actually be looking at them <clears throat> globally. Right. And until we do that, um, we're not going to be able to move from, you know, 
we're not going to be able to create real change. You know, I can recycle locally, but that isn't going to fix, you know, isn't going to help find a way forward in terms of climate change. Um, the other world is just playing moving faster with technology. Oh my gosh. Which is both good and bad. I mean, if someone comes up with a, a novel solution to a problem, it can go viral overnight. But at the same time, if somebody comes up with something that's really incoherent, <laughs> um, starts like, I don't know, the recent uh, hacking, for instance, that becomes a real threat worldwide. So our problems are both local, they're both global, they're becoming more complicated, and things are going at the speed of light. So again, something like dialogue that slows things down so that we can really look at the root cause of our problems right. before we go faster makes all kinds of sense. Right, and pausing and looking at that root cause, you know, it's again, in keeping with what Einstein said to us years ago, that we can't solve our problems at the same level that they were created. So we need to be able to pause and really tune into the thinking that's going on so that we can see where, what do we need to shift in our own thinking in order to move forward in a different way. And, you know, I think the other thing that's happening out there that's really prime for dialogue is that we've got this crisis of cultures happening, both just in a small way with say in the business world, more, more and more companies are merging and having, having to meld their cultures. Dialogue's perfect for that. But we're also seeing tremendous immigration and, and large movements of people who share very different cultural assumptions about the way the world works. So I, again, I think this is a very, very useful time for dialogue to reemerge in our culture. So, well, thanks, Glenna. We're going to talk more about the very specifics of dialogue and our two trainings in another little clip. So stay Great. tuned. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.